2. Finish discarding first. Start by discarding, all at once, intensely and completely. You think you have tidied everything perfectly, but within a few days you notice that your room is becoming cluttered again. As time goes by, you collect more things, and before you know it, your space has reverted to its previous state. This rebound effect is caused by ineffective methods that tackle tidying only halfway. As I've already mentioned, there is just one way to escape this negative spiral, by tidying efficiently all at once, as quickly as possible, to make the perfect clutter-free environment. But how does this create the right mindset? When you tidy your space completely, you transform the scenery. The change is so profound that you feel as if you are living in a totally different world. This deeply affects your mind and inspires a strong aversion to reverting to your previously cluttered state. The key is to make the change so sudden that you experience a complete change of heart. The same impact can never be achieved if the process is gradual. To achieve a sudden change like this, you need to use the most efficient method of tidying. Otherwise, before you know it, the day will be gone and you will have made no headway. The more time it takes, the more tired you feel, and the more likely you are to give up when you're only halfway through. When things pile up again, you will be caught in a downward spiral. From my experience with private individual lessons, quickly means about half a year. That may seem like a long time, but it is only six months out of your entire life. Once the process is complete and you've experienced what it's like to be perfectly tidy, you will have been freed forever from the mistaken assumption that you're no good at tidying. For the best results, I ask that you adhere faithfully to the following rule. Tidy in the right order. As we've seen, there are only two tasks involved, discarding and deciding where to keep things. Just two, but discarding must come first. Be sure to completely finish the first task before starting the next. Do not even think of putting your things away until you have finished the process of discarding. Failure to follow this order is one reason many people never make permanent progress. In the middle of discarding, they start thinking about where to put things. As soon as they think, I wonder if it will fit in this drawer, the work of discarding comes to a halt. You can think about where to put things when you've finished getting rid of everything you don't need. To summarize, the secret of success is to tidy in one shot, as quickly and completely as possible, and to start by discarding. Before you start, visualize your destination. By now you understand why it is crucial to discard before thinking about where to keep things. But to start discarding without thinking ahead at all would be like casting yourself into the negative spiral of clutter. Instead, begin by identifying your goal. There must have been some reason you picked up this book. What was it that motivated you to tidy in the first place? What do you hope to gain through tidying? Before you start getting rid of things, take the time to think this through carefully. This means visualizing the ideal lifestyle you dream of. If you skip this step, not only will it delay the whole process, but it will also put you at higher risk for rebound. Goals like, I want to live clutter-free, or I want to be able to put things away, are too broad. You need to think much more deeply than that. Think in concrete terms so that you can vividly picture what it would be like to live in a clutter-free space. One client in her 20s defined her dream as, a more feminine lifestyle. She lived in a messy seven-mat room. Seven tatami mats take up about 10 by 13 feet of floor space, with a built-in closet and three sets of shelves of different sizes. This should have been sufficient storage space, but no matter which way I turned, all I could see was clutter. The closet was so stuffed the doors wouldn't shut, and clothes oozed from the set of drawers inside like the stuffing in a hamburger. The curtain rail over the bay window was hung with so many clothes that there was no need for a curtain. The floor and bed were covered in baskets and bags filled with magazines and papers. When my client came home from work, she moved the things on her bed to the floor, and when she woke up, she put them back on the bed to make a path to the door so she could go to work. Her lifestyle could not have been called feminine by any stretch of the imagination. What do you mean by a feminine lifestyle? I asked. 
She thought for a long moment before finally responding. Well, when I come home from work, the floor would be clear of clutter. And my room, as tidy as a hotel suite with nothing obstructing the line of sight, I'd have a pink bedspread and a white antique-style lamp. Before going to bed, I would have a bath, burn aromatherapy oils, and listen to classical piano or violin while doing yoga and drinking herbal tea. I would fall asleep with a feeling of unhurried spaciousness. Her description was as vivid as if she actually lived that way. It's important to achieve this degree of concreteness when visualizing your ideal lifestyle. If you find that hard, if you can't picture the kind of life you would like to have, try looking in interior decorating magazines for photos that grab you. Visiting model homes can also be useful. Seeing a variety of homes will help you get a feel for what you like. By the way, the client I just described does indeed enjoy post-bath aromatherapy, classical music, and yoga. Redeemed from the depths of disorder, she emerged to grasp the feminine lifestyle to which she aspired. Now that you can picture the lifestyle you dream of, is it time to move on to discarding? No, not yet. I can understand your impatience, but to prevent rebound you need to move ahead properly, step by step, as you launch into this once-in-a-lifetime event. Your next step is to identify why you want to live like that. Look back over your notes about the kind of lifestyle you want, and think again. Why do you want to do aromatherapy before bed? Why do you want to listen to classical music while doing yoga? If the answers are, because I want to relax before bed, and I want to do yoga to lose weight, ask yourself why you want to relax and why you want to lose weight. Maybe your answers will be, I don't want to be tired when I go to work the next day, and I want to lose weight so that I can be more svelte. Ask yourself why again for each answer. Repeat this process three to five times for every item. As you continue to explore the reasons behind your ideal lifestyle, you will come to a simple realization. The whole point in both discarding and keeping things is to be happy. It may seem obvious, but it is important to experience this realization for yourself and let it sink into your heart. Before you start tidying, look at the lifestyle you aspire to and ask yourself, why do I want to tidy? When you find the answer, you are ready to move on to the next step, examining what you own. Selection Criterion Does it spark joy? What standard do you use to decide what to get rid of? There are several common patterns when it comes to discarding. One is to discard things when they cease being functional. For example, when something breaks down beyond repair or when part of a set is broken. Another is to discard things that are out of date, such as clothes that are no longer in fashion, or things related to an event that has passed. It's easy to get rid of things when there is an obvious reason for doing so. It's much more difficult when there is no compelling reason. Various experts have proposed yardsticks for discarding things people find hard to part with. These include such rules as discard anything you haven't used for a year, and if you can't decide, pack those items away in a box and look at them again six months later. However, the moment you start focusing on how to choose what to throw away, you have actually veered significantly off course. In this state, it is extremely risky to continue tidying. At one point in my life, I was virtually a disposal unit. After discovering the art of discarding when I was 15, I focused on how to get rid of things, and my research efforts escalated. I was always looking for new places to practice, be it my siblings' rooms or the communal storage lockers at school. My head was full of tidying tips, and I had complete, albeit misguided, confidence that I could tidy any place. My particular goal at that time was to get rid of as much as possible. I applied every criteria suggested by the various books I read on reducing. I tried getting rid of clothes that I hadn't worn for two years, discarding another item every time I bought something new, and throwing away anything I wasn't sure of. I threw out 30 bags of garbage in one month. But no matter how much I discarded, not a single room in my house felt any tidier. In fact, 
I found myself going shopping just to relieve the stress, and so failed miserably to reduce the total volume of my possessions. At home, I was always uptight, constantly on the lookout for superfluous things that could be discarded. When I found something not in use, I would pounce on it vengefully and throw it in the garbage. Not surprisingly, I became increasingly irritable and tense and found it impossible to relax even in my own home. One day after school, I opened the door to my room to begin cleaning as usual. At the sight of that untidy space, I finally lost it. I don't want to tidy anymore, I cried. Plopping myself down in the middle of my room, I began to think. I had spent three years tidying and discarding things, yet my room still felt cluttered. Would someone please tell me why my room isn't tidy when I work so hard at it? Although I did not say this out loud, in my heart I was practically shouting. At that moment, I heard a voice. Look more closely at what is there. What do you mean? I look at what's here so closely every day I could drill a hole through it all. With that thought still in my head, I fell fast asleep right there on the floor. If I had been a little smarter, I would have realized before I became so neurotic that focusing solely on throwing things away can only bring unhappiness. Why? Because we should be choosing what we want to keep, not what we want to get rid of. When I woke up, I knew immediately what that voice in my head had meant. Look more closely at what is there. I had been so focused on what to discard, on attacking the unwanted obstacles around me, that I had forgotten to cherish the things that I loved, the things I wanted to keep. Through this experience, I came to the conclusion that the best way to choose what to keep and what to throw away is to take each item in one's hand and ask, does this spark joy? If it does, keep it. If not, dispose of it. This is not only the simplest, but also the most accurate yardstick by which to judge. You may wonder about the effectiveness of such a vague criteria, but the trick is to handle each item. Don't just open up your closet and decide after a cursory glance that everything in it gives you a thrill. You must take each outfit in your hand. When you touch a piece of clothing, your body reacts. Its response to each item is different. Trust me and try it. I chose this standard for a reason. After all, what is the point in tidying? If it's not so that our space and the things in it can bring us happiness, then I think there is no point at all. Therefore, the best criterion for choosing what to keep and what to discard is whether keeping it will make you happy, whether it will bring you joy. Are you happy wearing clothes that don't give you pleasure? Do you feel joy when surrounded by piles of unread books that don't touch your heart? Do you think that owning accessories you know you'll never use will ever bring you happiness? The answer to these questions should be no. Now imagine yourself living in a space that contains only things that spark joy. Isn't this the lifestyle you dream of? Keep only those things that speak to your heart. Then take the plunge and discard all the rest. By doing this, you can reset your life and embark on a new lifestyle. one category at a time. Deciding what to keep on the basis of what sparks joy in your heart is the most important step in tidying. But what concrete steps are needed to efficiently eliminate excess? Let me begin by telling you what not to do. Don't start selecting and discarding by location. Don't think, I'll tidy the bedroom first and then move on to the living room, or I'll go through my drawers one by one starting from the top down. This approach is fatal. Why? Because most people don't bother to store similar items in the same place. In the majority of households, items that fall into the same category are stored in two or more places scattered around the house. Say, for example, you start with the bedroom closet. After you have finished sorting and discarding everything in it, you are bound to come across clothes you kept in a different closet or a coat draped over a living room chair. You will then have to repeat the whole process of choosing and storing, wasting time and effort, and you cannot make an accurate assessment of what you want to keep and discard under such conditions. Repetition and wasted effort can kill motivation, and therefore it must be avoided. For this reason, 
I recommend that you always think in terms of category, not place. Before choosing what to keep, collect everything that falls within the same category at one time. Take every last item out and lay everything in one spot. To demonstrate the steps involved, let's go back to the previous example of clothing. You start by deciding that you are going to organize and put away your clothes. The next step is to search every room of the house. Bring every piece of clothing you find to the same place and spread them out on the floor. Then pick up each outfit and see if it sparks joy. Those, and only those, are the ones to keep. Follow this procedure for every category. If you have too many clothes, then you can make subcategories, such as tops, bottoms, socks, and so on, and examine your clothes, one subcategory at a time. Gathering every item in one place is essential to this process because it gives you an accurate grasp of how much you have. Most people are shocked at the sheer volume, which is often at least twice what they imagined. By collecting things in one spot, you can also compare items that are similar in design, making it easier to decide whether you want to keep them. I have another good reason for removing all items in the same category from drawers, closets, and cupboards and spreading them out on the floor. Things stored out of sight are dormant. This makes it much harder to decide whether they inspire joy or not. By exposing them to the light of day and jolting them alive, so to speak, you'll find it surprisingly easy to judge whether they touch your heart. Dealing with just one category within a single time frame speeds up the tidying process. So be sure to gather every item in the category you are working on. Don't let any slip by unnoticed. Starting with mementos spells certain failure. You launch into your day all fired up to tidy, but before you know it, the sun is setting and you've barely made a dent in your belongings. Noticing the time with a start, you feel yourself sinking into self-reproach and despair. And what are you holding in your hands? More often than not, it's one of your favorite comic books, an album, or some other item that brings back fond memories. My advice to begin tidying not by room but by category does not mean that you should start with any category you like. The degree of difficulty involved in selecting what to keep and what to discard differs greatly depending on the category. People who get stuck halfway usually do so because they start with the things that are hardest to make decisions about. Things that bring back memories, such as photos, are not the place for beginners to start. Not only is the sheer volume of items in this category usually greater than that of any other, but it is also far harder to make a decision about whether or not to keep them. In addition to the physical value of things, there are three other factors that add value to our belongings. Function, information, and emotional attachment. When the element of rarity is added, the difficulty in choosing what to discard multiplies. People have trouble discarding things that they could still use functional value, that contain helpful information, informational value, and that have sentimental ties, emotional value. When these things are hard to obtain or replace, rarity, they become even harder to part with. The process of deciding what to keep and what to discard will go much more smoothly if you begin with items that are easier to make decisions about. As you gradually work toward the harder categories, you will be honing your decision-making skills. Clothes are the easiest because their rarity value is extremely low. Photographs and letters, on the other hand, not only have a high sentimental value but are also one of a kind. Therefore, they should be left until last. This is true for photographs in particular because they tend to turn up at random while sorting through other categories and in the most unexpected places, such as between books and papers. The best sequence is this. Clothes first, then books, papers, Comono, miscellany, and lastly, mementos. This order has also proven to be the most efficient in terms of the level of difficulty for the subsequent task of storing. Finally, sticking to this sequence sharpens our intuitive sense of what items spark joy inside us. If you can dramatically accelerate the speed of the decision-making process just by changing the order in which you discard, don't you think it's worth a try? Don't let your family see. Marathon tidying produces a heap of garbage. At this stage, the one disaster that can wreak more havoc than an earthquake 
is the entrance of that recycling expert who goes by the alias of Mother. One of my clients, whom I'll call M, lived with her parents and one sibling. They had moved to the house 15 years earlier when M was still in grade school. Not only did she love buying clothes, but she also saved those that had sentimental value, such as school uniforms and t-shirts made for various events. She stored these in boxes and stacked them on the floor until the floorboards were completely obscured from view. It took five hours to sort and clean. By the end of that day, she had 15 bags to get rid of, including eight bags of clothes, 200 books, various stuffed toys, and crafts she had made at school. We had stacked everything neatly beside the door on the floor, which was now finally visible, and I was just about to explain a very important point. There's one secret you should know about getting rid of this garbage, I began, when the door opened and in came her mother bearing a tray of iced tea. Oh dear, I thought. Her mother set down the tray on a table. Thank you so much for helping my daughter, she said, and turned to leave. At that moment, her eyes fell on the pile of garbage by the door. Oh my, are you going to throw that away? She said, pointing to a pink yoga mat on top of the pile. I haven't used it in two years. Really? Well, maybe I'll use it then. She began rummaging through the bags. Oh, and maybe this too. When she left, she took not only the yoga mat, but also three skirts, two blouses, two jackets, and some stationery. When the room was quiet again, I sipped my iced tea and asked Em, So how often does your mother do yoga? I've never seen her do any. What I had been about to say before her mother came in was this, Don't let your family see what's here. If at all possible, take the bags out yourself. There's no need to let your family know the details of what you throw out or donate. I especially recommend that my clients avoid showing their parents. It's not that there is anything to be ashamed of. There's nothing wrong with tidying. However, it's extremely stressful for parents to see what their children discard. The sheer volume of the pile can make parents anxious about whether their children can survive on what's left. In addition, despite knowing that they should rejoice at their child's independence and maturity, parents can find it very painful to see clothes, toys, and mementos from the past on the rubbish heap, especially if they are things they gave to their child. Keeping your garbage out of sight is considerate. It also protects your family from acquiring more than they need or can enjoy. Up to this point, your family was perfectly content with what they had. When they see what you have chosen to discard, they may feel guilty at such blatant waste, but the items they retrieve from your pile just increase the burden of unnecessary items in their home. And we should be ashamed of forcing them to carry this burden. In an overwhelming percentage of cases, it is the mother who retrieves things from her daughter, yet mothers rarely wear the clothes they take. The women I work with, who are in their 50s and 60s, invariably end up discarding or donating their daughter's hand-me-downs without ever wearing them. I think we should avoid creating situations like this where a mother's affection for her daughter becomes a burden. Of course, there's nothing wrong with other family members actually using the things you don't need. If you live with your family, you could ask them, is there something you need that you were planning to buy? Before you start tidying. And then if you happen to come across exactly what they need, give it to them as a gift. If you're mad at your family, your room may be the cause. Even if I tidy, the rest of my family just messes things up again. My husband's a pack rat. How can I get him to throw things away? It can be very annoying when your family doesn't cooperate with your attempts to achieve the ideal home. This is something I experienced many times in the past. At one time, I was so absorbed in tidying that cleaning my own room was not enough. I just had to tackle my siblings' rooms and every other space in the house, and I was constantly frustrated by my untidy family. A major cause of distress was the communal storage closet in the middle of the house. To me, more than half of it seemed to be devoted to unused and unnecessary junk. The clothing rods were jammed with outfits I had never seen my mother wear, and suits belonging to my father that were clearly obsolete. Boxes of manga belonging to my brother covered the floor. I would wait until the timing was right and confront the owner with this question. 
you don't use this anymore, right? But the response was either, yes, I do, or I'll get rid of it myself, which they never did. Every time I looked in that closet, I would sigh and complain. Why does everyone keep accumulating things? Can't they see how hard I'm working to keep the house tidy? Fully aware that I was an anomaly when it came to tidying, I was not going to let them defeat me. When my frustration reached the limit, I decided to adopt stealth tactics. I identified items that had not been used for many years, judging by their design, the amount of dust they had gathered, and the way they smelled. I would move those items to the very back of the closet and observe what happened. If no one noticed that they were missing, I disposed of them, one item at a time, just as if I were thinning plants. After three months of this strategy, I had managed to dispose of ten bags worth. In most cases, no one noticed, and life went on as usual. But when the volume reached a certain point, people began to miss a thing or two. When they pointed the finger at me, I responded quite shamelessly. My basic strategy was to play ignorant. Hey, do you know where my jacket went? Nope. If they pressed me further, my next step was denial. Muddy, are you sure you didn't throw it out? Yes, I'm sure. Oh, well, I wonder where it could be then. If they gave up at this point, my conclusion was that whatever the item had been, it hadn't been worth saving. But if they were no longer fooled, I still wasn't phased. I know it was here, Muddy. I saw it with my own eyes just two months ago. Far from apologizing for discarding their things without permission, I would retort, I threw it out for you because you weren't capable of doing it yourself. In retrospect, I must admit that I was pretty arrogant. Once exposed, I was met with a flood of reproach and protest, and, in the end, I was forbidden to tidy anywhere but my own room. If I could, I'd go back and give myself a good smack and make sure that I didn't even consider such a ridiculous campaign. Getting rid of other people's things without permission demonstrates a sad lack of common sense. Although such stealth tactics generally succeed and the items discarded are never missed, the risk of losing your family's trust when you are caught is far too great. Besides, it just isn't right. If you really want your family to tidy up, there is a much easier way to go about it. After I was banned from tidying other people's spaces and had nowhere to turn but my own room, I took a good look around it and was struck by a surprising fact. There were far more items that needed discarding than I had noticed before. A shirt in my closet that I had never worn, along with an outdated skirt that I wouldn't wear again. Books on my shelves that I knew I didn't need. I realized with a shock that I was guilty of exactly the same thing I had been so bitterly accusing my family of doing. Not being in a position to criticize others, I sat down with my garbage bags and focused on tidying my own space. After about two weeks, a change began to occur in my family. My brother, who had refused, no matter how much I had complained, to get rid of anything, began a thorough sorting of his belongings. In a single day, he disposed of more than 200 books. Then my parents and my sister gradually began to sort and discard their clothes and accessories. In the end, my whole family was able to keep the house much tidier than before. To quietly work away at disposing of your own excess is actually the best way of dealing with a family that doesn't tidy. As if drawn into your wake, they will begin weeding out unnecessary belongings and tidying without your having to utter a single complaint. It may sound incredible, but when someone starts tidying, it sets off a chain reaction. Cleaning quietly on one's own generates another interesting change. The ability to tolerate a certain level of untidiness among your family members. Once I was satisfied with my own room, I no longer felt the urge to dispose of things belonging to my siblings or parents. When I noticed that communal spaces such as the living room or bathroom were messy, I cleaned them up without a second thought and never bothered to mention it. I have noticed this same change occur in many of my clients as well. If you feel annoyed with your family for being untidy, I urge you to check your own space, especially your storage. You are bound to find things that need to be thrown away. The urge to point out someone else's failure to tidy is usually a sign that you are neglecting to take care of your own space. This is why you should begin by discarding only your own things. 
you can leave the communal spaces to the end. The first step is to confront your own stuff. What you don't need, your family doesn't either. My sister is three years younger than me. Quiet and a bit on the shy side, she prefers to stay inside and draw or read quietly rather than to go out and socialize. Without a doubt, she suffered the most from my research on tidying, serving as my unsuspecting victim. By the time I was a university student, my focus was on discarding, but there were always things that I found hard to dispose of, such as a t-shirt that I really liked but that somehow didn't look right. Unable to bring myself to part with it, I would try the item on repeatedly, standing in front of the mirror, but in the end, would be forced to conclude that it just didn't suit me. If it was brand new, or a gift from my parents, the thought of getting rid of it made me feel very guilty. At times like this, my sister came in very handy. The gift for my sister method seemed the perfect way to cast off such items. When I say gift, I don't mean that I wrapped it up like a present. Far from it. With the unwanted outfit in my hand, I would barge into my sister's room where she lay on her bed reading contentedly. Extracting the book from her hand, I would say, You want this t-shirt? I'll give it to you if you like. Seeing the puzzled look on her face, I would deal the final blow. It's brand new and really cute, but if you don't need it, I'll have to throw it away. Are you okay with that? My poor, mild-mannered sister would have no choice but to say, I guess I'll take it then. This happened so frequently that my sister, who hardly ever shopped, had a closet jammed to overflowing. Although she did wear some of the clothes I gave her, there were many more that she wore only once, if ever. Yet I continued to give her presents. After all, they were good clothes, and I thought she should be happy to have more. I only realized how wrong I was after I began my consulting business and met a client whom I will call Kay. Kay was in her twenties, worked for a cosmetics company, and lived at home. As we were sorting through her clothes, I began to notice something odd about the choices she was making. Despite the fact that she owned enough clothes to fill one large closet, which is an average size wardrobe, the number of clothes she chose to keep seemed unnaturally small. Her answer to the question, does this spark joy, was almost always no. After thanking each item for a job well done, I would pass them to her to discard. I couldn't help noticing the look of relief on her face every time she put an outfit in the bag. Examining the collection more closely, I saw that the clothes she chose to keep were mostly casual things like t-shirts, while the ones she discarded were a completely different style, tight skirts and revealing tops. When I asked her about this, she said, My older sister gave me those. When all the clothes were sorted and she had made her final choice, she murmured, Look at that. I was surrounded by all this stuff that I didn't even like. Her sister's hand-me-downs had comprised over a third of her wardrobe, but hardly any of these had given her that important thrill of pleasure. Although she had worn them because her sister had given them to her, she had never liked them. To me, this seems tragic, and this is not an isolated case. In my work, the volume discarded by younger sisters is always greater than the volume discarded by older sisters, a phenomenon surely related to the fact that younger children are often accustomed to wearing hand-me-downs. There are two reasons why younger sisters tend to collect clothes they don't really like. One is that it's hard to get rid of something received from family. The other is that they don't really know what they like, which makes it hard to decide whether they should part with it. Because they receive so much clothing from others, they don't really need to shop, and therefore they have less opportunity to develop the instinct for what really inspires joy. Don't misunderstand me. Giving things you can't use to others who can is an excellent idea. Not only is it economical, but it can also be a source of great joy to see these things being enjoyed and treasured by someone close to you. But that is not the same as forcing things onto your family members because you can't bring yourself to discard or donate them. Whether the victim is a sibling, a parent, or a child, this particular custom should be banned. Although my sister never complained, I am sure that she must have had mixed feelings when she accepted my hand-me-downs. Basically, 
I was simply transferring my guilt at not being able to discard them onto her. In retrospect, that was pretty despicable. If you want to give something away, don't push people to take it unconditionally or pressure them by making them feel guilty. Find out in advance what they like, and if you find something that fits those criteria, then, and only then, should you show it to them. You can also offer to give it to them on the condition that it is something they would have been willing to pay for. We need to show consideration for others by helping them avoid the burden of owning more than they need or can enjoy. Tidying is a dialogue with oneself. Kunmari, would you like to come stand under a waterfall? I got this invitation from a client, a charming woman who was still an active business manager and an avid skier and hiker at the age of 74. She had been practicing meditation under running water for more than a decade and seemed to really enjoy it. She would casually remark, I'm off to a waterfall, as if she were going to the spa. Consequently, the place she took me was not a spot for beginners on an introductory tour. Leaving our lodgings at six in the morning, we hiked along a mountain path, climbed over fences, and forded a river where the rushing water came up to our knees, until we finally reached a deserted waterfall. But I didn't bring up this subject because I wanted to introduce this peculiar form of recreation. Rather, I found through this experience that there is significant similarity between meditating under a waterfall and tidying. When you stand under a waterfall, the only audible sound is the roar of water. As the cascade pummels your body, the sensation of pain soon disappears and numbness spreads. Then a sensation of heat warms you from the inside out and you enter a meditative trance. Although I had never tried this form of meditation before, the sensation it generated seemed extremely familiar. It closely resembled what I experience when I am tidying. While not exactly a meditative state, there are times when I am cleaning that I can quietly commune with myself. The work of carefully considering each object I own to see whether it sparks joy inside me is like conversing with myself through the medium of my possessions. For this reason, it is essential to create a quiet space in which to evaluate the things in your life. Ideally, you should not even be listening to music. Sometimes I hear of methods that recommend tidying in time to a catchy song, but personally, I don't encourage this. I feel that noise makes it harder to hear the internal dialogue between the owner and his or her belongings. Listening to the TV is, of course, out of the question. If you need some background noise to relax, choose environmental or ambient music with no lyrics or well-defined melodies. If you want to add momentum to your tidying work, Tap the power of the atmosphere in your room, rather than relying on music. The best time to start is early morning. The fresh morning air keeps your mind clear and your power of discernment sharp. For this reason, most of my lessons commence in the morning. The earliest lesson I ever conducted began at 6.30, and we were able to clean at twice the usual speed. The clear, refreshed feeling gained after standing under a waterfall can be addictive. Similarly, when you finish putting your space in order, you will be overcome with the urge to do it again. And, unlike waterfall meditation, you don't have to travel long distances over hard terrain to get there. You can enjoy the same effect in your own home. That's pretty special, don't you think? What to do when you can't throw something away. My criterion for deciding to keep an item is that we should feel a thrill of joy when we touch it. But it is human nature to resist throwing something away even when we know that we should. Items that we can't bring ourselves to discard even when they don't inspire joy are a real problem. Human judgment can be divided into two broad types, intuitive and rational. When it comes to selecting what to discard, it is actually our rational judgment that causes trouble. Although intuitively we know that an object has no attraction for us, our reason raises all kinds of arguments for not discarding it, such as, I might need it later, or it's a waste to get rid of it. These thoughts spin round and round in our mind, making it impossible to let go. I am not claiming that it is wrong to hesitate. The inability to decide demonstrates a certain degree of attachment to a particular object. 
nor can all decisions be made on intuition alone. But this is precisely why we need to consider each object with care and not be distracted by thoughts of being wasteful. When you come across something that's hard to discard, consider carefully why you have that specific item in the first place. When did you get it, and what meaning did it have for you then? Reassess the role it plays in your life. If, for example, you have some clothes that you bought but never wear, examine them one at a time. Where did you buy that particular outfit and why? If you bought it because you thought it looked cool in the shop, it has fulfilled the function of giving you a thrill when you bought it. Then why did you never wear it? Was it because you realized that it didn't suit you when you tried it on at home? If so, and if you no longer buy clothes of the same style or color, it has fulfilled another important function. It has taught you what doesn't suit you. In fact, that particular article of clothing has already completed its role in your life, and you are free to say, thank you for giving me joy when I bought you, or thank you for teaching me what doesn't suit me, and let it go. Every object has a different role to play. Not all clothes have come to you to be worn threadbare. It is the same with people. Not every person you meet in life will become a close friend or lover. Some you will find hard to get along with or impossible to like. But these people, too, teach you the precious lesson of who you do like, so that you will appreciate those special people even more. When you come across something that you cannot part with, think carefully about its true purpose in your life. You'll be surprised at how many of the things you possess have already fulfilled their role. By acknowledging their contribution and letting them go with gratitude, you will be able to truly put the things you own, and your life, in order. In the end, all that will remain are the things that you really treasure. To truly cherish the things that are important to you, you must first discard those that have outlived their purpose. To get rid of what you no longer need is neither wasteful nor shameful. Can you truthfully say that you treasure something buried so deeply in a closet or drawer that you have forgotten its existence? If things had feelings, they would certainly not be happy. Free them from the prison to which you have relegated them. Help them leave that deserted isle to which you have exiled them. Let them go, with gratitude. Not only you, but your things as well, will feel clear and refreshed when you are done tidying. <laughs>